Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and welcome to my channel. My name is Bruce and the call sign G4ABX. For those of you that have been following me since I started this little venture last August, you'll know that um, I'm mainly focused on QRP, low power, portable radio operation, um, which I find very interesting and, and quite challenging. This year, I thought we might up the ante a bit and make it even more challenging. The last time I went camping, I was 14 years old, I think 14 years old, and it was the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme, where myself and a bunch of mates um, got taken by our teacher to some <laughs> field somewhere in the uh, wide blue yonder, as it were, or wide green yonder, and um, after doing numerous tests of bushcraft and various things, we had the challenge of sleeping overnight. Well, we all had tents, but we decided actually one of us had a bigger tent and we'd just put that one up and we'd all sleep in there. Needless to say, it poured with rain, it was a howling gale, and we hadn't pitched it in a great place and it was a pretty uncomfortable night, but when you're 14, it really doesn't matter. I'm sure somebody must have uh, bought a bottle or two of beverage with them and I think that kept us amused most evening. <laughs> so it's a very long time ago since I did any camping. Camping has changed a lot in the time. <laughs> a lot. And I've been doing some research uh, using the resources of YouTube and, and various other channels uh, to really understand where camping has gone. Now. In order to operate uh, portable and to have enough room um, to sleep and be comfortable, etc., etc., I decided that uh, quite early on a single person tent probably wasn't going to work. So I'm going to buy a two man tent. In, in fact, I've already bought it, and what I'm going to talk to you about now is the journey on the way to sorting out which was which. I've reviewed dozens of tents, absolutely dozens of tents, and I've come up with a short list, a short list of four. And I'm going to share those with you now, explain why I did, uh, why I've chosen, uh, what I've chosen, and um, this will be uh, an adjunct to the portable radio operation, but it'll now be with camping. And hopefully this will enable me not only to do the parks on the air, which I've been doing for the last um, I don't know, nine months, I guess. Uh, parks on the air is where you put all your radio gear in the car, uh, you drive to a park somewhere, unload your gear onto a park bench or park table and operate from there. Um, so it's, it's interesting, but it's not completely challenging. The, the really challenging activity is what is called summits on the air, where you drive to a car park, put a backpack on and then trek up the side of a hillock or a mountain. In my case, it won't be very tall mountains, I can assure you, um, and operate from the summit, hence the summits on the air. So Sota and Pota, as they're both called in the amateur radio community, are kind of worldwide ongoing competitions, if you like. And you have people who chase summits, so people who are looking to work you at the top of the summit, um, and you work summit to summit, and Mostly it's low power operation for summits on the air because you don't want to be lugging around great heavy rigs and big batteries. Uh, so it's, it's challenging. Um, normally summits on the air is a 5 watt power limit um, and um, that's what we're going to try. So I thought I'd try and combine the summits on the air activity, which will be new for me this year, with a bit of camping. So this is the catalogue of the journey to get here. Right. So let's start by having a look at the tents, because without a tent, I don't think you legitimately can say you've been camping. So, the tent. Right, uh, the first tent uh, I looked at is, um, uh, you can probably spot the, uh, the well-known uh, <laughs> site that I'm looking at. This first site, first uh, tent that I spent some time researching was called the Nature Hike Cloud Up 2. It's quite well reviewed, people quite like it. Um, they don't absolutely love it and it, it has a number of uh, limitations that become apparent as you move through. It's not very expensive, that's the first thing to say. 
I've set myself a budget of £250 for a tent, which is reasonable. You know, I'm not looking at the Rolls Royce of tents, which are £1,500 in this category. But I, I'm looking for something that's uh, you know, reasonably inexpensive, uh, reliable, because I'm not going to buy loads of tents. This, I don't want the tent to become yet another hobby that gets upgraded every year, like the radio gear. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping to avoid that. So I want to buy a tent that's going to last me for a few years, at least until it's broken or destroyed or whatever. So the Nature High Cloud Up 2. A um, few things I didn't like very much about this tent. Um, I don't like the fact that the uh, vestibule area is quite small. Um, vestibule area at the front here <coughs> is where you do your, your cooking. Uh, and where you put your wet gear and wet gear is important uh, having a place to put it because I shall be camping in the UK and in France and certainly in the UK the weather's pretty unpredictable so invariably you're going to get caught in rain at some point. Um, so this has got reasonably well reviewed but not compelling enough for me to actually decide to make the purchase. So the next tent I've looked at is the sibling, the slightly more expensive sibling. So the previous one I think is about £135 in the UK. This one is about £185, £190 in the, new, in the UK. Now it's gone up £50 in the last four months, I guess. Um, I like this tent. Um, it, it, was all, it was my favourite for quite a while. Until you start to get into in-depth reviews where they don't just say what a wonderful tent this is and unpack it from the bag um, and they, they actually do some work with it and use it and, and show you what's good, bad or indifferent. And despite the fact that this design is pretty much copied from the most expensive tent I looked at, which I think was £1,500, um, they've not copied it quite well enough. <laughs> This hat that you see on the top, whilst an extremely good idea, because underneath here is the ventilation mesh uh, for the tent to uh, keep the condensation down and, and keep it aerated. But this hat, rather stupidly, if it rains uh, and this hat uh, diverts the rain off the edges, that's brilliant. But unfortunately, where it diverts the rain off the edges over the door area, if you have the door open, uh, the rain not only drops into the vestibule area, but it drops into the inside of the tent, of the inner of the tent. Uh, I haven't quite got the angles right. So given that um, water is a problem in the UK, <laughs> falling from the sky at least, um, I pretty much discounted this tent on the basis of the poor design of this. And being an engineer, I like things to be reasonably well designed. So I moved on to tent number three which is the MSR Elixir 2. Now, this to me looked to be a really nice tent and, and became my kind of front runner, probably for the best part of two months, as I looked around for other bits and pieces, which we'll get onto in due course. Um, it, it has a, a well-designed vestibule area, which is probably the largest of all the tents. Uh, you basically unzip it here, pull this out, and uh, you, you're left with that kind of area in a tent, excellent. Uh, plenty of space. What it does have, however, is lots of mesh inside. All of this stuff here is mesh. Now, the problem with mesh is that uh, it's, it's both a problem and a benefit. Uh, it, it lets the air through. Great. Uh, the problem is it lets the air through, and if the air is really cold, the tent gets really cold. The other thing I didn't quite like about this is the, is the poles arrangement. So this tent has three poles. The other tents I've looked at, uh, the previous uh, Cloud, Cloud Peak 2, that had three poles. But this one has a rather fiddly pole that's across the top here. That's a good idea because it pulls the sides of the tent out to give you a bit more vertical height in the door area, which, which is a good idea. Um, but the other thing I didn't like about this tent, apart from uh, the... the fiddliness of getting this final pole connected and if you watch a few videos online you'll see people who are much more able than me at putting up tents um, struggling to get this thing done properly. Uh, the other problem is that one, you have to kind of assemble the inner first and put the rest of the tent over the top which is not great uh, because you absolutely do not want to be assembling your tent inner, the thing that you're going to be in, in the rain. And we're back to the rain again, but uh, I, I may be 
overly pe pessimistic, but as I said, I'm going to buy one tent. So I, I don't want to have to buy a tent that doesn't do for me uh, and has to be upgraded every, every, I don't know, twice a year or something daft like that. So this tent, apart from being, uh, as I said, forerunner for quite a while, uh, slipped out of favour when I discovered this one. And this is the Helm Compact 2, made in the UK by Terranova, which was another bonus. Um, I, was, uh, I was very comfortable with that. And, and this tent has a number of benefits over the others um, and is the one that I've actually purchased. So uh, it, uh, it was delivered yesterday. I haven't got, I haven't been and unwrapped it yet. Uh, and I'll explain why in a moment. But what I really liked about this tent, A, it, it has a good size vestibule, but all these tents, by the way, are two-doored, so that there's a door on each side. So if you do have a second person with you, you know, they can get out of the other side of the tent. Although I'm not planning to have two people, uh, the other side of the tent, the other bit will be for holding my radio gear. But why I like this tent, from an engineering perspective, it's very well designed. It, it has two aluminium loops, as it were, sets of poles that are bent over to form uh, the structure. Uh, this pole, in fact both poles, actually go through seamed areas, so they're attached to the main body of the tent. Unlike um, the other tents, uh, where actually the poles are attached to the inner through clips, this one is, is completely attached and, and in fact mirrors the most expensive tent that I looked at, uh, which is probably the best tent in the category, um, but at an order of magnitude less in terms of expense almost. It has a couple of good vents on the side, which is, which is excellent, one on each side, uh, controllable, um, and it has much less mesh. So this area here, rather than being mesh, is actually material. So. This tent should be less cold in the colder months of uh, you know, early spring and um, early autumn, which are probably the limits of when I, I shall actually operate. So this is the tent that I've bought. And uh, it, it, looks, it looks good. Uh, all the tents are self-supporting or semi-self-supporting, so you can assemble the tent and then move it to wherever you want. Uh, within reason by picking the whole thing up and literally just moving it around before you have to put out the guys. Uh, there are four main guys on this tent um, and some pegs to hold down the uh, the outer and the vestibule and those sorts of things. Um, looks to be very easy to assemble and it's also quite compact. It's not the lightest of the tent, in fact I think it's the heaviest of the tent. Uh, that also said good things to me because it the material of the tent is the most robust of the tents that, that I've looked at. So, so starting with the uh, Nature Hike, it's, it's pretty thin stuff. Um, this is pretty similar. This is a lot better. Uh, this one is better still. And, and the Helm Compact 2 is the one that I, as I say, I've purchased. The one downside of this tent that uh, annoyed me a bit is that you buy the tent for uh, 260 quid, as it happens, and then you have to buy what I always used to call the ground sheet and is now called the footprint for an extra 42 or 43 pounds, which frankly I think is a bit rich. Um, all these other tents actually come with the footprint included. Um, so why these guys think that uh, they shouldn't do that uh, I, I, uh, is beyond me. But unfortunately I bought the tent and therefore I needed the footprint too because I'm not going to buy another tent for a while. And the footprint is the thing that saves the bottom of the tent when you put it down on less than perfect ground. <clears throat> and as I, I won't be camping on the lawn, uh, well, I might just try it out, but I should be camping on hillsides and fields and things like this and the edge of woods. The chances are there's going to be bits of debris on the ground. So having a footprint that you put down before the tent, I, I think, is a, is a very wise precaution. I probably won't be... Uh, carrying the tent up to wonderful views like this. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll have some interesting places to go. So, so that's, my, that's been my journey on tents. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to have got where I've got. I would say that in terms of two-man tents, uh, particularly if you want to use uh, the thing for amateur radio portable operation, this is probably <clears throat> the best tent I've found in the UK as a two-man. I did look at single-person tents, one-man tents, but decided that 
they were just too small in terms of footprint and I, I'm not being out I'm not getting out there being uncomfortable I, I want to be comfortable uh, as comfortable as you can be which takes me to the next subject which we're not going to cover now but the subject <coughs> The, the, the subject of sleeping kit. Now, I always thought sleeping kit was just a sleeping bag you put in your tent, uh, but no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's a science in itself. So more of that next time. Okay, that's all I want to say for now. So I hope you enjoyed that short introduction um, to the best tent for amateur radio portal operation available in the UK. Um, and... I'll say 73s for now, and I hope you have a great day. We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time.